So yeah, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. Uh, on Wednesday, we did all of chapter 1. And if you, you remember, 1 John is a book that theologians believe is the introduction to the Gospel of John. On top of that, the book is all about how do you know that you know that you know that you're saved? Is it because you confessed Jesus as Lord? Is it because you got baptized? Is it because you went to church all your life? Is it because you read the Bible? Is it because you had a warm, fuzzy feeling one time? How do you know? All of the above. Uh, all of the above. Well, well, we'll look at that. John, the disciple John, the apostle John, you will see in the book of John, he does not mention his name. He doesn't call himself John. Do you know what he calls himself? The disciple that Jesus loved. Now, Jesus loved all his disciples. He had 12. But he had an inner circle of three. John, Peter, and Andrew. Sorry, John, Peter. Peter, James, and John. I'm sorry. Peter, James, and John. Where is it? You know, three. But John was the one he loved. Every, every apostle was brutally killed for their faith. Except for John. Jesus loved John. And John loved Jesus. We can learn a lot about that. So let's pick up in chapter 2, verse 1. Who's, which dog is one? Sophie. Sophie. My little children. This is John writing. He says, my little children. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. What does John call his congregation? Fellowship. What did he call them? The church. My little children. How does John see his congregation? Does he see them as family? His children. His. These are people that he's raising up. This is a true pastoral heart. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So why is John <laughs> writing this letter to his church? He loves them. Okay. To keep them from sin. To keep them from sin. So that you don't sin. Okay. Why do you think John doesn't want them to sin? Pulls them away from God. It's not because I don't want you to be bad people. You know, sinning is bad. But it's because as Christians, as Christians, our punishment for sin has been paid for by Christ. But if we do sin, it puts a wedge in that relationship with Christ. <laughs> My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with 
the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. What does he call Jesus Christ the righteous? Pardon me? An advocate. Okay, so what is an advocate? Speaking for us. Speaking for us. It's someone who's got your back. She got nipped at. Oh, by a dog? Yeah. yeah. I think the water. He was, he was going up to the water. Her water. Yeah. And she went to take it away and he nipped it. Or... Yeah. Oh. So, uh, did you guys get this? Who was advocating for you? Jesus. Who is he advocating to? No, he's that he's advocating for us, but who is he advocating to? God the Father. Do you see this? Jesus is going to his father and said, Paid for. Paid for. Paid for. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. Oh, that's a big word. Propitiation. That is my most favorite word in the Bible. You guys don't know what it means. There are two definitions for propitiation. There is a religious definition and there is a legal definition. And they go hand in glove. And it's the most beautiful word in the Bible. I'm going to give you the legal definition first. Have you guys ever heard of a guy by the name of Martin Luther? Okay. What do you know about Martin Luther? No. No, Martin Luther King. It was a preacher in the South. Do you know who Martin Luther is? No. Have you guys ever heard of the Lutheran Church? Yeah. Okay. Martin Luther did not start the Lutheran Church, but his followers did. Martin Luther, he was a Catholic priest who taught at a seminary. But before he was a Catholic priest, he was studying to be a lawyer. Now, at that time in the Catholic Church, they were going off the rails theologically. And he was studying the Book of Romans to teach the Book of Romans. And just in the book of Romans alone, he found 97 things the Catholic Church was doing wrong and contrary to the Bible. And so, have you guys, anyone gone to college or university for any any length of time? No? Okay. Everyone's been on Facebook. If you want to start a debate on Facebook, you post your opinion, and everyone starts debating, right? At this time in Germany, Martin Luther was a German. Wittenberg, you know where Wittenberg is? Okay. He was teaching at Wittenberg, and he took these, it's called Martin Luther's 97 uh, Theses. 97 things the Catholic Church was doing wrong, and he nailed it 
to the Wittenberg door. And what that means is I want to talk about these and let's debate these. Okay. Martin Luther was a genius of a man. On top of that, because he was studying to be a lawyer and he's studying Romans and all the all the books of the Bible tied together when he saw this word propitiation he knew what it meant the legal term for propitiation do you know what that is argue no it's even better than that it's to pay somebody else's fine have you guys ever got a speeding ticket okay You've got a speeding ticket. Now imagine you have a speeding ticket and you can't afford to pay the speeding ticket. Your dad shows up and pays the speeding ticket. Does the law care who paid the speeding ticket? As long as the speeding ticket is paid. That's the legal term for propitiation. To pay someone else's fine. The theological term for propitiation means a sacrifice offered to God to appease the full wrath of God. So what we have here in this word propitiation, Jesus was the sacrifice offered to God. He took God the Father's full wrath on Him to pay our fine because we did not have the eternal funds to pay it. You get that? Isn't that the most beautiful word in the Bible? Propitiation. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, <coughs> Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Does this mean that everyone in the whole world, their sins are paid for? Yes. No. Yes, no. Okay, let's talk about it. They're paid for, but it's a, it's a gift and those for, for those who receive it. Okay. So, there's two trains of thought on this and I agree with both of them the first is Jesus died only only for the people who will believe in him well, that day that we you talked that day that you talked you and I talked I remember something that you said to me and it really stuck yeah when you said question you asked if you don't accept a gift that was give offered yeah was it ever really yours exactly the other train of thought is Jesus blood is sufficient to pay for every sin that everyone has ever committed but it's only efficient for those who believe and that's what I think most people like to believe yeah so everyone's everyone in the world has the opportunity to receive the gift but only those who receive the gift get the gift. Yeah. 
therefore every sin is has been paid for. However, it's if, still if, a gift. If you don't receive the gift, that's then, right. Then it's not yours. That's right. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only, f and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him. Okay, we need to be pay attention because he's going to give us how we know. It's not because you said a prayer. It's not because you got baptized. It's not because you're part of a Bible study group or a church. And by this we know that we have come to know him. If. That word if, that's conditional. This is the condition. And by this we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commands. Jesus tells us in the book of John. If you love me. You will obey. Verse 4. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. I want you to see how scary this is. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I, meaning him, not me, him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to the Father except through me. You say that you know him, you don't keep his commands, you are blaspheming his name and you are calling Jesus a liar. Do you know why that's so scary? Matthew 28, 18, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You go call the person who has all authority by just one word can kill you a liar that's how much power he has he can just say to you you're dead and you're dead and he can still say to you live and you'll live that's how much authority Jesus has Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, in the person who keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected. Where is the love of God? In those who keep His Word. What has the love of God become? Let's read it again. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. Have you guys ever been searching for perfect love? 
the perfect love of God is perfected in us when we keep his commandments. So here's the oxymoron. We can't keep his commandments. It's unless we live like him. Unless we live like him. What's the only way we can live like him? Get to know him. Okay. By his word. Get to know him, respect him, obey him. Okay. You can obey, obey, obey. You can try all your righteous works. The book of Isaiah says, our righteousness is like filthy rags to God. Do you know what the Hebrew term for filthy rags is? Used menstrual cloths. And now you're thinking, God, why are you being so vulgar here? He's not. In the Old Testament, when when they were still, when the Israelites were still living in the wilderness, the law was when a woman was on her cycle, she had to be a, away from the camp because it was ceremonially unclean. And when her cycle was over, she was allowed back in the camp. And what God is saying is, if you try your righteousness on your own, you are put out of the camp forever. What happens? How do we know that we keep his commandments? God himself has changed our hearts. He himself in the form of the Holy Spirit lives in us. And through that, we keep his commandments. We have some new, very new believers here. You're going to run into something. You will sin. And your sin is going to affect you differently now. Before, when it did not bother you, now it's going to tear you up inside. And the reason why it tears you up inside is God himself is living in you now. And he's saying, Jason, you're not living in my love. You are not letting me perfect my love in you. Come back to me. Repent of your sin and walk in my commandments. My toe is sticking out. But whoever keeps his word in him truly, the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Okay, him in us, us in him. By this, we will know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him. Okay, let's stop here. Abide. Is that a verb or a noun? I don't even know. Okay. Take a wild guess. We've got some young people... Okay, so abide. <coughs> if you say abides, okay, you're close. We have some other people here that are freshly out of school or still in it. Abide, verb or noun. If they say I abide, is that a verb or a noun? Do I house? Is, is, is a house a verb or a noun? That's a verb. 
A verb? So how do you house? How do you tree? Okay, so house is a noun. So abides is a verb. It's an action word. Okay. Now, what is the noun version of abide? You guys know? Abode. What is an abode? You don't know? What do you guys think an abode is? I thought obey, but no. no, it's like a house. It's a house. It's where you live. So what Yeah. My humble abode, right? Okay. Now, so what is John saying here? He's saying, whoever, when he says, whoever says he abides in him, meaning whoever says, I live in Christ. Whoever claims I live in Christ or whoever says, I'm a Christian. Whoever says he abides in him ought. Ought to walk in the same way he has walked. This walking, whenever walking is used as a metaphor, and you can tell it's a metaphor here, this is not uh, Monty Python in the Society of Silly Walks, right? It's the way you live. It's the way you live. If you say you live in Him, your lifestyle must match that. The love of God is perfected in you when you live your life the way that Jesus did. Do you guys get that? Jesus has two commandments. Two. And out of those two flow every other commandment. Do you know what those two are? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That means your whole everything should be focused on loving God. The second commandment is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. When you love God with everything, you will see how horrible you really are. And then you will again see the love of God on you. And you can take that love of God on you to your neighbor. I'm going to close with this story. There's a man in my church and in my Thursday night Bible study. His name is Ray. Ray's wife is dying. Three years ago, she was put up onto a heart tra- uh, for a lung transplant. Her name is Michelle. She was taken off the transplant list because the drugs that she was on helping her lungs get better. Then she got cancer. And the cancer medications fought against the lung medications. And we've been praying for her. And then the cancer went away. And they thought they'd go on a little date to Dairy Queen by the Walmart medicine hat. And there was a lady there holding a cardboard sign. 
going to Quebec, going home to Quebec, out of money, need help. Ray comes up to her and says, what's going on? She said, well, we were out picking fruit in the Okanagan, which a lot of Quebecers do. And we got to Medicine Hat, and our car broke down. And my husband just spent our last amount of money getting the part that we need. And the husband bought the wrong tool. They are flat broke. Ray says, hold on a minute. He lives around the corner. He goes and gets the right tool. Goes and grabs a couple Bibles. Puts gospel tracts in those Bibles. Hands in the Bibles. Hold on to these. These are for you. Fixes the car. Buys them lunch. Gets them some gas money to get home. People around the Dairy Queen after they left said, Why would you do that? He said, Because that's the second greatest commandment. You love your neighbor as yourself. And the first is you love God with everything. So he got to witness to five or six people about Jesus Christ because of that. And you know what happened? When that couple got home, they thanked. They called Ray up and thanked him again. Is the love of God perfected in you? Are you walking as Jesus walked? How do you know that you know that you know that you're saved? You love God with everything you have. You love your neighbor as yourself. And it's shown by your lifestyle. Amen? Amen.